This morning we're going to be looking again in Luke's gospel. We already had our reading from Luke, but I'd like us to look at a parable that Jesus gave to his disciples with the express purpose of encouraging them always to pray and not to lose heart. That's in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. And in a certain sense, this is what we're going to be looking at throughout the day, uh, this morning and this evening. Uh, we're going to be focusing on this morning on the fact that we uh, should always be praying. And this evening, we're going to be looking at um, the faith that we need to have, the trust in the Lord, that He will do what, what He has promised, that we not look at the circumstances, but we look to Him. Well, first of all, let's read the, the parable and see what our Lord has to say. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel. Now, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection for my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect, who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Again, we're not going to look at everything that this has to say. We're going to focus mainly on, on the importance of, of prayer. This evening, we'll, we'll look at what he means by, will there be faith on the earth when he comes? Now, let me just remind you that last week we were looking at the fact that we can look to Jesus Christ as our example in absolutely everything. He not uh, only lived a life that was pleasing to the Father to fulfill what was required of us so that Jesus could save us. Remember, it is his obedience that is actually given to us as a free gift. Well, he obeyed not just for that reason, but he obeyed that he might give to us an example that we are to follow. As a matter of fact, when he says, follow me, and he says that many times as he's gathering together his disciples and people knew that uh, uh, being a disciple meant to follow Jesus. What Jesus meant was not just walk behind me wherever I go, but he meant imitate me, learn from me, learn what I have to say, learn from my example and do as I do. The Lord wants us to follow him. He is our example. Now, sometimes you might think it's difficult to connect to this example because Jesus was unique. He is fully God. The person that is in his human nature is the same person as the second person of the Godhead, the eternal Son of God. But we need to remember he is also fully man, that he became one with us, with all of our limitations. The only difference, of course, is that he had no sin. So everything that the man Christ Jesus experienced in this world, he experienced as a man. Everything he did, he did as a man. We shouldn't conceive of him as God wrapped up in a human nature. Jesus did not have the divine attributes in his human nature. He was fully man. And so he experienced everything we experience. And he is our pattern, our model in everything. And we shouldn't think that we're so different that we cannot follow that example. We do need to remember as well that it's his human image, his character, his life, that we have been predestined by the Father to be conformed to, that we might become like him, the man Christ Jesus. Well, Jesus actually came into the world to make us like him. That's why he's given us his Holy Spirit, so that we could become like him. Without a spirit, uh, there wouldn't be any possibility. Now, one thing that I want us to notice about Jesus, at least this morning, by way of his example, is that Jesus never became 
discouraged. Can you think, as you look through all of Scripture, one point in his life where he saw things as being hopeless? I mean, even on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was not the cry of hopelessness. He was actually using that to point the people who were there to the psalm that explained what he was going through. And yes, he was experiencing anguish. He was experiencing the wrath of God as it was poured out on him for our sins. But he knew that the Father loved him. He knew it was for his people that he was suffering. He knew that it was going to, to conclude that he was going to be buried, raised again, and glorified. He was never hopeless. Jesus did not become hopeless. He never gave up. One of the reasons why he didn't, or perhaps a couple of reasons, is because Jesus prayed. He often looked to his heavenly Father for help, and Jesus trusted the Father. Now, that is, I believe, the cure for discouragement and the cure for hopelessness and fear. Praying, knowing that the Father hears us, even as he heard Jesus. Trusting that the Father will do what he has promised in our lives as well as he did in his son. Now, this morning, what I'd like us to do is to look at this first cure for discouragement. I'd like us to look at prayer, and this evening, to look at the second, which is faith, trust in the Lord. Now, notice, first of all, that Jesus told his disciples this parable to guide them in something that they were already doing. In Luke 18, verse 1, now, he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Sometimes we sort of isolate different parts of these verses uh, and, you know, we, we say that Jesus here is, is telling them that they ought to pray, that they weren't praying before, but now they ought to. Well, we already saw in Luke 11 when they came to him and said, teach us to pray. Jesus taught them to pray. Uh, they were praying. What he's telling them here is that they ought to pray at all times and not lose heart. That's the focus of this particular text. Jesus is assuming they're already praying because prayer is something that every believer will certainly do. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we will pray. We will pray because the Spirit's work in our lives is to make us like Jesus and Jesus prayed. We might think again that uh, the Son of God in human flesh may, may not need to pray, but there was nobody who prayed as much as Jesus prayed. Before Jesus chose his disciples, he spent the whole night in prayer. We read in Luke 6, verse 12, it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Uh, throughout the whole of his ministry, he prayed. Uh, we read that after he fed the 5,000 in Matthew 14, verses 22 and 23, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. And we know, of course, before he went to the cross, he prayed, Matthew 26, 36, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Now again, our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God in human flesh, he prayed. If he prayed, how much more, of course, should we pray? But since we have the Spirit of God, since we have the Spirit who was leading Jesus, teaching Jesus, molding Jesus, counseling him and guiding him, and this is what the Spirit of God produced in him, we should also assume the Spirit of God is going to produce the same thing in us. If we have the Spirit, we will pray. Paul writes in Romans 8.15, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. That's what the Spirit of God works within us, this, this filial spirit that God is our Father and we are His children and we may come to Him and address Him as our Father and ask for the things that we need and that's exactly what we will do. You know, prayer has been called the, the breath of the new creation. 
It's one of the evidences that we are spiritually alive. We're breathing, as it were, breathing out spiritual desires to the Lord. From what the Scripture tells us, a Christian that doesn't pray is really a contradiction in terms. Every Christian prays because he has the Spirit of God in him. Now, I want you to notice, secondly, in this text, that Jesus is reminding them not only that they are praying, but he reminds them that it is their duty to pray. Luke 18, 1 again. He, now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Uh, prayer can be what we want to do, and certainly the Spirit of God works that within us, and it can be what we ought to do at the same time. And here's the beauty of the gospel, of what Jesus Christ has done for us. He gives us the power to obey by making us want to obey by His Holy Spirit. Uh, remember what Augustine said on one occasion? He says, Lord, command what you will. You're the sovereign Lord. You can tell me to do whatever you want me to do. And then he says, and give what you command. Give me the ability to do what you've called me to do. So we will obey this command because it is what we, by the grace of God, want to do. And we'll, of course, obey it because that's what our Lord calls us to do. Now, we're also, of course, going to obey this command because the Lord commands it for a reason. And the reason is so that we might get what it is that we need from the Lord. Because God is the only one, ultimately, who can give us the things that we need, what we need to live. James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. That's why we thank God for our food before we, we eat, because we recognize that it comes from Him. Everything we need to sustain us physically, all our food, our air, our water, our clothing, it all comes from the Father. And the spiritual power that we need to be able to fight the, the warfare the Lord is calling us to fight and to be able to overcome our enemies, the ones that are trying to throw us off center, the ones that are trying to keep us from engaging what the Lord has called us to do, which would be, of course, the world, which is under the control of the devil, and, of course, our flesh. Is there any other quarter in which enemies come except from these particular areas, from within and from without? Remember, this is what Jesus told us we should be asking for in the Lord's Prayer. He says in Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. Provide for our needs. This is what Jesus was teaching his disciples to do. Look to the Father to meet those needs. And then he says in verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In other words, give me victory over the enemies of my soul. We need to ask the Father for these things because he is the only one who can ultimately give us these things. He is the only source. So Christians will pray. It is our duty to pray, and it's our duty. The Lord commands us to do it because there are things we need from Him to sustain our lives and to help us in our Christian walk, in our Christian warfare, to live the kind of life He calls us to live. Now, thirdly, since it is our duty to pray, it's also our duty to set aside the things that will get in the way of our prayers that will keep the Lord from hearing and answering our prayers. And I'm just going to go over a few of them briefly. The first one would be sin. The psalmist writes in Psalm 66, verse 18, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. What that means is if, if I'm cherishing some sin, unwilling to give it up, and I come to the Lord and I say, Lord, provide me with this particular thing, He's going to say, what about that that you need to deal with? So we need to deal with it first, and that's one of the ways the Lord brings us to repentance. He withholds blessing so that we might do what is right. Unbelief, not trusting that God is actually going to provide. James says in James 1, verses 5 through 8, But if any of you lacks wisdom, 
let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We need to believe God's promise and trust that he's going to actually do what he said. James gives us another impediment to prayer, and that is selfishness. He says in chapter 4, verse 3, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Uh, Self-centered prayer is not going to be answered by the Lord. And James also deals with one other issue, and that is the sin of not praying, of not doing what the Lord is moving us to do and commanding us to do. In James 4, verse 2, he says, You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So if we don't ask, then obviously that's an impediment. But now let's look at the particular obstacle that Jesus is addressing in the parable of the unjust judge, which also may not necessarily stop us from asking, but maybe discourage us so that we leave off asking before the Lord gives us what it is we have actually asked for. Luke writes in Luke 18, verse 1, in what we call the parable of the unjust judge. Now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Jesus is going to encourage us through this particular parable that if persistence can move even the hardest heart, how much more will our Heavenly Father, who loves us and cares for us, be moved by our prayers when we come to Him? Now, we're going to spend the, just the remainder of this time focusing on this particular parable. And first of all, Jesus draws our attention to the character of this particular judge. Notice he says in verse 2, In a certain city there was a judge <clears throat> who did not fear God and did not respect man. Okay, he wasn't afraid of what God would do to him if he dishonored him. No fear of God. He wasn't concerned about his reputation what anybody else thought about what he did. Now, I want you to realize that in describing this man in this way, Jesus is saying he was completely unmotivated because these two motivations, one of these two, are what motivate everybody on the planet. Believers fear God, and they will do what the Lord calls them to do because they respect Him. Unbelievers fear men. They want to be thought well of by others. But you see, this unjust judge was not motivated either by a fear of God or a fear of man. And it shouldn't surprise us that if he didn't respect the Lord, that he's not going to care about his neighbor either. So here is a man who is unmoved by anything outside of himself. He only cares about himself. Now Jesus tells the second that someone came to him for protection. Somebody that he would have been the most obligated to protect and that is a widow, verse 3. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. You know, what's interesting here is that widows in those days were being treated like widows are being treated today. Widows are those who are most often victimized because they're the most defenseless, and that's also why the magistrate is called by God to protect them, along with a group of others who are vulnerable. The Lord said to the rulers of his people in Isaiah 1, verse 17, because they weren't doing this, he says, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. This was someone in this category that this magistrate was bound to protect above all others. Now, thirdly, he refused to listen to her when she came. 
I mean, why should he? He didn't care about what other people thought, how he treated her. He didn't care what God thought about how he treated her. All that was left was selfishness. And what would he gain by helping her? I mean, there was nothing in it for him. She didn't have any money by which she could bribe him. She was poor. And she didn't know anybody else who could influence him. But the interesting thing is, Jesus says, fourth, he did listen when she became a nuisance. And again, here we go, self-interest. She's wearing me out. So I'll do what she says. And we read about that in verses 4 and 5. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. Now, the thing to notice here is that the only reason that this judge gave her justice was because she was persistent, and it was purely out of self-interest that the judge did this. So now, here is our encouragement in verses 6 through 8. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will bring about justice for them quickly. If this unjust judge was willing to help this widow because she was so persistent, how much more will the Lord help us when we continually come to him? Now, here's where we need to draw some distinctions between our situation with the Lord and the widow's situation with the judge. And if he helped her in, in those circumstances, how much more will the Heavenly Father help us? Well, first of all, think about the fact that the widow was a stranger to the judge. He didn't even know her. But we are God's children whom he knows and whom he loves. How much more will he be inclined toward us? This judge didn't want her to come. She was a bother to him. But God tells us that he wants us to come and he wants us to ask for whatever we need. As a matter of fact, we have a command. We don't need to ask the question, does God want me to come? Jesus says we ought to pray at all times. This judge was unjust. We already saw he didn't care about anyone but himself. But the one we're coming to with our prayers is just, and he's righteous, and he cares for us, and he wants to help us. Now, she was coming simply for protection against her legal opponent. In a certain sense, she was coming for what the Lord, of course, guaranteed to her, but it was somewhat of, with self-interest in mind. And it was for something that the judge wasn't really at all concerned about. But we are coming to, to the Father for something that he cares about deeply. Not only our well-being, but the well-being of his kingdom. Because remember, our prayer requests are not just centered upon us, but that the Lord would meet our needs so that we would do what he calls us to do. We'd be able to move the kingdom forward. Remember how Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all the things that you need will be provided for you. Put, put the kingdom of heaven first and then I'll take care of your needs. Well, when we ask the Lord for the things that we need for our well-being, we're actually asking for the well-being of the kingdom of heaven because we're asking for these things so that we might be able to do what the Lord actually calls us to do. The kingdom will be first in our hearts as it is in his heart. And so we will seek him for those reasons. She had nobody to come before this judge and to speak on her behalf. She had no advocate. But we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who lives forever to intercede for us. She came not knowing whether or not this judge would listen. As a matter of fact, she came many times knowing he wouldn't listen. But we come to the Father knowing that he has promised that he will listen to us when we come to him in the name of his son, Jesus. Her continual pleading was irritating the judge, but our continual pleading actually pleases God. We read in Proverbs 15, verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked 
is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The Lord delights when we come to him in prayer. We don't, we don't tire him out. We don't bother him. He wants us to come. He wants us to pray. Now, like this widow, we have an opponent. Actually, we've already noted the fact that we have three opponents. That is the world and our flesh and the devil. And we need protection. We do need legal protection in a certain sense. Jesus has given that to us. If we're in Jesus, the devil cannot really make a charge stick against us because all of our sins have been forgiven. But we need his protection against his continual attacks against us, against his temptations. We need the Spirit. We need his help to be able to do the work that the Lord calls us to do when these enemies are working so hard to keep us from doing the work that our Lord calls us to do. And so we need to pray. Prayer, as I've already mentioned, is the only way that the Lord has provided for us to get the things that we need. But as we've already noted, there are certain things we need to do. We need to pray repentantly. We need to be turning from all of our sins. We need to pray believing. We need to have faith. Believing will be heard. Believing the Lord will answer. We need to pray with His glory in view, not asking just for things that we want just because we want them. We need to pray in hope, never being discouraged if the Lord does not answer us right away because we know the Lord will. It may not be in our timing. It may not be the answer we are asking for. Sometimes, you know, we tend to direct God, this is my need, and this is how I think you ought to meet this need, and so I pray, and if he doesn't meet the need the way I think he does, that he's not going to meet that need. But he still is. It's just going to be perhaps in a different time or in a different way, but he will answer our prayers. And so we need to pray in hope, and we need to pray continually. Remember, our persistence does not bother him. He actually delights in it. As a matter of fact, he commands it. Let me just close with this quote through Isaiah. And let's look at it as a closing exhortation to each one of us, even though it may have been given to a specific group of people who were to pray for Israel. I do believe it's simply reflecting what our Lord Jesus Christ called his disciples to do, and it's something he calls us to do as well. He says in Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord Jesus has also appointed us to pray for the well-being of his church and of his kingdom in the world. He says, give him no rest until he accomplishes his work in this world. So may the Lord help us uh, to do that. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And let's ask that, that he would encourage us in this way. And let's also, as we pray, uh, prepare to come to the table and, and to um, receive from the Lord um, not only that remembrance of what he has done for us, but also the grace that he promises to us to be able to help us do what he calls us to do. Let's spend a few moments in prayer, shall we?